Hi, this is Hart Hagen with Let's Talk, and we're here with Elaine Tanner with Friends for Environmental Justice. Elaine, how are you doing today? Hi, I'm doing fine. Um, enjoying a little bit of reprieve sitting on a mountain in southeast right. Kentucky. So uh, Elaine is with Friends for Environmental Justice. So Elaine, tell me about yourself and Friends for Environmental Justice, and we'll go from there. Uh, and I just wanted to say that I'm sure we're going to have a lot to talk about because we both have a passion for things like, for one thing, getting off fossil fuels. We have a, both have a passion for, uh, you know, preventing fracking and pipelines and petrochemicals, and also uh, using native plants to restore our native Kentucky habitat. So, but back to the original question, tell us about Friends for Environmental Justice. Um, the, my friend was born on the mountain here in Letcher County. And we bought the property 16 years ago. It had been in his family for six generations. When we got down here, uh, the water was poisoned. The only thing we could do was flush our toilets with the water. They weren't telling people, and there was a need for justice. And I started to look at how environmental and social issues were so intertwined. And then you come to Appalachia and you see people and, and, and there's a stigmatism there and people uh, can't go to school, kids can't go to school if you can't take a bath, you can't drink the water. In fact, at one time we were even told by the state of Kentucky and the Department of Water, the only thing we could do with our water was flush our toilets. It took two years before the neighbors were even told and we were able to get water testing in here and uh, filed a Safe Drinking Water Act and that was all a part of uh, when we needed to be formally organized, we became Friends for Environmental Justice almost five years ago. We were a 5013C at one time, but then there's um, rules that we um, can't speak out as much as we would like to. So now we're on our own. We're at ground zero and we follow uh, water quality issues in Appalachia on um, coal mining and uh, the legacy pollution that we deal with and then where it goes to the, from here and that goes into the Ohio River Basin which ties into a lot of my other work on pipelines and fracking and injection wells. Some of our work is even gone as through grassroots organizations as far as the United Nations. We've had our work go to the Pope. Yeah. Right. Well, that sounds like an accomplishment. I was going to ask you, tell me some of your main accomplishments, some, what you're proud of and happy about in your career as an activist. Um, well, let's kind of start out. I started out as an environmentalist and a very dear friend of mine, Lois Gibbs, says, you're an activist. And then I started seeing the big picture and getting to know her, have had the chance to work with her um, on with some people from um, Headwaters Defense in Minden, uh, West Virginia, which is a super fun site. And then I started seeing super fun sites all over. I have a background in real estate, 35 right. years. I got into real estate thinking I was gonna fix brownfields. <laughs> <laughs> Took another direction. I always say, and I'm since retired, but I always say when my two worlds started to collide. So it was really interfering with my real estate business because I was so spoken outspoken on some of these issues. And of course my clients were invested in oil and gas. And you know, so it was just that big picture that started to come together. Um, we would come down to the mountains in southeastern Kentucky. We would fire them up. In order to file a Safe Drinking Water Act, you must start at the bottom. You start locally with your county officials. I was able to uncover $2 million worth of misappropriated funds on a federal grant that was not meant for the neighborhood in the county judges neighborhood that the $2 million went to. So in the meantime, the people out in this most remote community in Letcher County were again being poisoned. And um, so as soon as I uncovered that, took it to Washington, took it to Atlanta, Department of Justice. I took it to uh, or EPA, to uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, anybody that would listen within six months after filing a 1431 Safe Drinking Water Emergency Act, our people got water. 99 families that live on Mill Creek now have water that is safe. I think there's a couple that never tied in because they didn't have the money. The Safe Drinking Water Act fails us. And I've done some work up in Michigan, but it fails us because in an emergency act, they are to give us bottled water within 10 days. They're to give us a buffalo. We can operate our house within 30 days. And within one year, you are to get water. 
not one bottle of water came out here from our county, our state, or our federal government. So um, part of my work is um, making sure this doesn't happen to other communities. We saw it in Flint, Michigan. We see it all over. We look at blood quality issues and some of the things that happen. But in Appalachia, these people have been poisoned. And my roots, um, my grandparents, great-grandparents were from the Daniel Boone National Forest here in Kentucky. I spent summers on the bluffs and seeing you know, this wonderful biodiversity of nature there and learning the things my grandmother could teach me. One of the things that my grandmother taught me uh, as a child, um, I was never allowed to go up on the mountain because of the snakes and I was a girl. And I spent the summers there and my cousins came down as I'm going. So we went up to the top of the hill. But there was a reason behind that grandma would never let me go. She said that if you um, have a, if you, if you, you know, kill a snake and you cut his tail off, it's going to wiggle away. If you cut his head off, it's going to die at sunset. And I have taken that those words with me, fighting pipelines, because that is a snake that we're dealing with that is happening all over the country. And we're getting a little bit of reprieve right now. We don't know where that's going to go, but that I think is very important. So back to our um, work in, in here on Mill Creek and in Kentucky, we got involved with a lot of grassroots organizations. Um, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth took us by the hand and they would show us the people that we needed to talk to and they would support us in getting us there. And, and, and how was that? Um, that would have been in, we started 2012 is when I first mm -hmm. filed the Safe Drinking Water Act. Mm -hmm. Now, before that, we said here we could come down to the mountain and we could enjoy it, thinking it is what it is mining. His uncle had signed a mining lease, and then we could go home. And home at that point was southeastern Ohio. When I got home, I ended up looking to the north and I had an old Sunoco pipeline that was um, a wartime line when everybody was feeling patriotic and they signed these leases to allow. And then I started watching these pipelines going underneath Amish porches. People had no clue and they had threatened to reverse the flow. You go 10 miles without anybody detecting anything going on in these pipelines and it's citizen monitored. Then I ended up with three miles from my house. Uh, Nexus was a pipeline, or I'm sorry, Utopia East was a pipeline that I was fighting there. And I stood there, um, we had a national event called Hands Across the Lands, and I stood there with five people trying to stop the, this pipeline going across their backyards. And what was interesting was the um, couple years before, there was a, a situation, they contacted me and said, there's a compost facility going in and it's a really bad idea that we're gonna take 25 acres in the middle of this small village. And you know, the wind goes Northeast, right? <laughs> and I was Northeast of this. And so I went in and organized the community. Um, we looked at um, the Army Corps of Engineers and, and the wetlands and having had some experience with this before, within six weeks, we had them withdraw their permit. Simple facts, they were being run out. Uh, and, and this is all research and there's people that helped me do this. And they were being run out of the Cleveland area because of this leachate that was going into all the properties. And it was just a garbage dump. They were gonna bring in medical uh, waste and you ha would have uh, animals and just all of these problems. It doesn't belong in a small village. And you had the local economic development trying to bring them in. They were trying to railroad it in through uh, regulations and not properly following the uh, zoning rules. <laughs> gets better. The zoning inspector was selling the land to the, so anyway, uh, they had 20 EPA, viol EPA violations in the state of Ohio. And the simple thing was there was one man's name was on both permits and they withdrew the permit. So that took us about six weeks to do that one. Um, I dealt with Rover in my backyard and this is all. So in I, I, I'm getting the idea that citizen involvement works. Citizen involvement works. I'm sitting at, uh, so I had dealt with Rover. Rover was two 42-inch pipelines coming through my community. My county commissioners at that point had signed an agreement with- Where's this? In Ohio, Southeast Ohio? Yes, Ashland County, Ohio. Okay. okay. So the um, commissioners had signed an agreement with uh, Energy Transfer Partners, which is Rover Pipeline, which is the uh, Mariner East, which is, you know, the BioBridge, all of these pipelines controlled out of Texas. And our commissioners signed an agreement they could get um, 
gas run to our industrial park, if they could go through our county parks, if they could go, and it was less than 2,000 feet from a school, uh, the vocational school from three counties. And ironically, our emergency managers, uh, management directors, um, desk. So why would that be problematic? How's that gonna harm the kids in the school? Two 42 inch gas lines of, and this was a fracked gas, and the there is no explosion limits to what this could do. This was six and a half feet of gas coming mm -hmm. under pressure. Um, so the emergency management director was right there 80 feet from this pipeline. So they take that out, they take our health department out, they take our kids out, and it just got worse and worse. So I pretty much- What do you mean they take them out? I mean, they would be gone if this pipeline- Oh, okay, yeah. I just kind of throw it out there the way sure. I hear it, the way yeah. I see it. Yeah. Um, so we ended up, um, Rover went through, Frack Tracker came in. I have a very good friend, Ted Ock, that um, came in and we would set up drones and we flew over our entire county and documented everything. Then we headed to the Ohio River, you know, and did some work down there on Rover. It was crossing under the river. And, but to kind of wrap up the uh, community um, grassroots organizing, there was a, uh, in the southern part of my county, I had gotten uh, a, click on our website and it was someone who lived in the area and says we need help they're getting ready to frack us and these people had no idea what was going on and I said hey guess what I'm next door so I went down we started organizing we did not realize what we were dealing with we were dealing with Cabot Oil. Cabot Oil is the same corporation that was destroying Demick Pennsylvania's water table. And I'd organized with these people at big events, uh, Washington and, and going to different places around the country. So uh, we had people whose water had been destroyed, they'd been in these cases, and there was fracking all around them. They threatened us with 50,000 fracked gas wells in our backyard. So we were able to organize. We got the list from our people that were endemic that says these are the chemicals that you need to look for. This is about the corporation. This is in Ashland County, southern, southeastern Ohio. Okay. Yes. And then we're communicating with the people in Demick, Pennsylvania that had them in their backyard that had been fighting them for years. So um, what we found out is there was um, they were dealing with underground gas storage areas that had been there since the early turn of the last century. And they, people agreed to lease their lands. Again, this is a patriotic thing where, you know, that keeps popping up and they agreed to lease their land for gas storage. And these are old empty caverns. They pump the gas out and then they go down in and they fill it with gas and it's regulated. Uh, right now we see a lot of problems with the storage of gas in this country. There is no room for storage. Yeah. Let, let, okay. Gas storage. It, it just seems like that would leak. If you put it in the ground, it seems like it would leak. The methane that we have tracked through Earthworks, and these are some of the organizations I've worked with. Um, yeah, we document it. And it how do you has, detect the leak? There is a uh, FLIR camera that they use that shows the emissions. And okay. they're starting to see something like you could see from space. I mean, it's that mm -hmm. bad. Okay. But there was other problems there, too. So the old gas storage wells, we, we kind of put a, a, a Kabat on that because they needed to rewrite all of these leases before they could drill through these storage areas. They only had permission to, to store gases in there. So we went around to all the communities. We're dealing with three counties at this point, a little grassroots group over here and one over here. We formed a coalition and we started knocking on doors. We started holding county meetings. We started going to commissioners meetings and making people aware of what was going on. One of the biggest problems that I see that was coming to the area and had already been there for a long time were these fracking injection waste wells. In Ohio, I understand there's like 400 of them now. In my county, there were 70 of them. There's 400 of them. In, in where? In Ohio. In, in, the in the state of Ohio, there's 400. And so in this seven. is where they are storing the frack wastewater. And these are slow flow injection wells. So they'll bring up a truck and they'll open it up and they will allow this stuff to sink into the earth. And the biggest problem with that is the concrete casing that they say um, is good. Well, how long does concrete work? You know, right. and you're putting a line in there, salt eats concrete. So we lose yeah. our casing. And the, the seven- and This out stuff of the is really radioactive, right? It's, yes. It, it, uh, it has like 10,000 times as much uh, radioactive as, 
has safe drinking water. Am, am I right about that? That's what Cheryl Johncock said. Yes, and Cheryl is right. Um, have you ever talked with Justin Noble? Name sounds familiar. I, okay, I'll, I'll make you, I'll put you in touch with them. Yeah, please um, do, please do. I worked with him. He did some a hitchhiker's tour. He's coming out with a book. He writes for Rolling Stone and Belt Magazine. And he just came out against this radioactive piece because of the damage that the, the harm that it does to the workers. You know, we, we know what it does to our water. We know yeah. we, we, we know when they spray this brine on our roads, where it goes, it goes into the water. Yeah. But Justin has exposed this. And um, I've, like I say, I've toured with him. We, you know, we walk him in and say, this is what's going on. And, and you need to talk to this person. And he's just been awesome. So, you know, it's we'll, like we'll put you can't make this stuff up. I mean, this is evil. This is cartoon villain type stuff. I mean, this is so bad. People really don't know. Like I said, down here, I knew what I was dealing with, with mining and mine acid and mudslides and, you know, illegal permit actions. And, you know, I stopped a few of those myself. Um, but I go to Ohio, I didn't understand it's fracking. Then I didn't understand how they were going to crack underneath the Ohio River, which is the water supply for 5 million people. I organized there with the Ohio River Citizens Alliance. I, I see that you are, are, Trying to understand. No, it's crazy. It, it's crazy. I'm I'm fairly new to this, but it's just it's like the the hits keep on coming. Like what what they're willing to do to poison our water and our air and expose workers to carcinogens, and it goes on and on and on. Well, if, for example, back in the Ashland County area, um, some of the things that we did to combat this. Okay, so we had the list of chemicals from Demick, Pennsylvania. We tied up with a, a company called Simple Water out in Berkeley, California. We got water testing for our people. We did our own baseline. Cabot Oil says, oh, we got your water test, and that's their test. These people needed their own baseline testing, so we put that in action. We had a health fair. We had, uh, we go to commissioners meetings, and, you know, we would expose, you know, <laughs> where their new office was. They were here to stay, and they drilled four wells, and these were going to be a well pad. So on a well pad, they can put anywhere from 15 or 10 to 15 wells on these pads. And they said they didn't find what they were hunting for. How, and, how big is a well pad? Um, it, it, it varies, usually about 10, 15 acres, but it depends. I mean, I've seen some down in southeastern Ohio pretty bad. Um, I also saw some that were in uh, uh, planned along the Ohio River. Um, so I was contacted by one of the organizations I work with, which is the Ohio, um, OVEC is, is in yeah. uh, Virginia. And um, they needed someone to go into a meeting with the Department of uh, Gas and Oil and the EPA that was, or DEP, which was in West Virginia. So um, it was a meeting and when I got there, I discovered that what they were doing is Eclipse um, was an oil company and they were coming in and they wanted to drill. And um, they wanted to change the spacing of how far frack lines could be apart because Ohio's rules were different. And they didn't have the jurisdiction to that. So that there was a, the, the company was there with a stack of foot high of these, this is how we're gonna do it things. When they found out they didn't have any jurisdiction, they closed the books and they had the maps hanging on the wall. Well, I had a, little visitor's badge on, so nobody knew if I was a visitor from where or who or if I was with the state. They really couldn't see what was going on, but I had two minutes to look at those maps, and it scared the hell out of me, to be honest with you. They were ready to, to frack a five-mile stretch along the Ohio River, and at the time, the five-mile stretch appeared to be, and we still don't know, and it's, you know, it stopped now, but it was in the Wayne National Forest. There's a 30-mile stretch that runs along there. So another grassroots growth. And um, Keep Wayne Wild is a great organization that I, in fact, Cheryl and I have done some organizing on that. And, you know, but I would do things like I would, they'd have a fairy festival, and I would go in with my little petition, and it would, didn't know at the time it was, um, uh, being sponsored by oil and gas. I was kind of new to the area. So I'd get them on this ferry going back and forth across the river and my petition in my mouth and they had to hear me. I had this captive audience. <laughs> <laughs> it was That's great. brilliant. You know? That's great. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, the only thing that I had a hard time with was whenever I pulled um, uh, up to go into the event, there were, you know, your vendors on both sides and <clears throat> there was a gentleman that came up to me and he saw my t-shirt 
that says Ohio River Rising. Yeah, we rose. We also had a march and, you know, camp and some other things going on that weekend. And he asked me who I was and what I was doing there. So I proceeded to tell him. And I was by myself at the time. And then my partner came up a little bit later. And he says, um, you know, at that time, I'm feeling a little braver. I said, well, just let me ask you who you are and why are you asking? It was one of the state representatives from Ohio. Uh, Hoagland is his name, and later to find out that he was the one who sponsored the bill for, and, and I worked on it under uh, uh, House Bill 250, Senate Bill 33, these were the anti-terrorism acts, and he was the one who wrote the bill, and he also owned two private security companies. I was speechless, but anyway, um, yeah, he told me to watch it. So I do, I look over my back once in a while, but you don't make friends doing what we do. We right. end up telling people what they don't want to hear. Um, just the big picture sometimes is more than we can bear. Um, so kind of back finishing up Ohio, uh, there's, they came back in you know, a year later and they did another well. And you know, we have these big pipelines coming through now. They have, the infrastructure is there and the product isn't needed. So right now, I think we have a good opportunity that we can take what we've got. You mean and, with, and, with oil prices being low or are you talking about something else? No, I'm talking about the oil prices being low, the demand being in there. And we've got um, the last count I heard was 30 tankers, which are you know the size of football fields out in the San Francisco Bay. They don't have any place to put it. So they're storing this stuff on ships. And I guess it's growing every day you know, the amount of ships that are coming in that they can't bring them in to the harbor because they have no place to put it. Mm -hmm. um, mother's mad, you know, and the only thing that can happen right now is, is they stay safe or we open up our eyes and we start doing things that are going to stop our consumption of these fossil fuels. And I look at right now, as of a couple of days ago, they were, they were down 30% uh, less production. Um, Today, we had the most wonderful news on the Ohio River Valley that there was a, a Korean company that was trying to build one of their petrochemical plants, which would be the second one on the Ohio River. And they've been looking at that since 2015. And they decided that this just wasn't a good time to invest their money in the United States oil and gas industry. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's some good things that happen. We have wins every day. We just have to appreciate them, share them. And then when you have a community that's you know, down and saying, hey, uh, you know, how many times I have, when I was at the meeting in West Virginia that I told you about, and I came back across the river and I literally stood on Route 7, which runs all the way along the Ohio River. It's Ohio scenic, by the way, with my hands in the air. I needed help. So I started writing some letters and some emails and I got a hold of Oil Change International and Earthworks and um, I got involved with the uh, Indigenous Environmental Network and said, we need help. We need people to wake up and to come and stand with us on these issues. You know, it, you can support these movements and you can do it. Um, I did a, um, a um, story this week on um, what's going on out with the tankers and what we can do. And, and you know, we, we look at the plastic, these fracked gas, that, those two 42 inch pipelines I told you about was fracked gas, that makes plastic. It was being pushed across the state, free states under eminent domain, and it was being exported. It's had nothing to do with what we are doing here. And so the- um, It was being exported? Yes. Yeah, most of the oil products coming out of the Ohio River Valley are. Um, See, Albert that's the thing. That's the thing. So the Obama administration changed their ban on exports. They lifted the ban on being able to export fossil fuels. And that, that, the, what that does is it makes us, it, it makes uh, people pollute our backyard to send, uh, send, a, it, it's to send the product overseas. It just, it increases the incentive to pollute our air, our water, our bodies. Well, what we're dealing with right now is, um, I mentioned the petrochemical plant that's no longer coming here. Well, you know, just a few short years ago, you had a president standing on the banks in Cincinnati on the Ohio River saying, we're going to welcome them to this country. We're going to give them money to come in and build this infrastructure. No. 
we can't do that. We, we, we right now, we have an opportunity. Um, there's a lot of talk about the fossil fuel industries being bailed out because of the um, COVID-19 virus. The oil and gas industry has been failing for the last four years. It's not because of a virus. It's because we don't need it anymore. It's because right. we are waking up. You know, I... I um, and because the U.S. is the world's leading producer of oil, you know, we've got so much supply now. Yes, and it could take us two years to use and that. Thing, thing is, let me see if this makes sense. So people, people talk about the oil industry going out of business because the oil prices are low. I don't buy that. I think what's going to happen is that the little producers are going to get bought up by the big producers. The big producers are going to be better off than ever because they're going to have all of these assets that they, you know, they have the money to wait around for, for prices of the drilling operations to go down so they can scoop them up. I, I'm not convinced that, the, that this low oil price is going to ultimately reduce the, the consumption or the production, you know? Um, yeah, divestment is a wonderful thing. <laughs> um, and I, you know, we, we've so had explain some divestment. Explain divestment. Divestment. If you have a company that a bank that is um, supporting these fossil fuel product products, uh, for example, we had years ago in um, Washington, there was a group of Quakers who went in while we were doing a Water Act, and we go down for a week of week, week in Washington and do our lobbying stuff, and they go into the BNC Bank and they put a tarp down and they put a pile of dirt and they took the top off of the mountains because that bank was supporting mountaintop removal. Um, you have, I mean, those are just little actions. You can, I, I tend to look at it and I've, and I've, you know, done it in some sessions for different organizations that, you know, describes a specific divestment program. One that I worked with the people on that it was their idea, but I just helped them enhance it was the county money. Where is your retirement being invested? Is it being invested in fossil fuels? That's an important way to do it. Um, we need to watch Marathon. It's the only U.S. oil company refinery business. It's the biggest. Uh, we have other ones in here. We have from other countries, but Marathon sits in on the Ohio River. Their refineries are there. Um, you mentioned buying back out the little guys. That's exactly what they're getting ready to do. They then they would have control. Especially of since they get the stimulus money. The big Wall Street corporations get the stimulus money. They get all these loans, and uh, it, the fact that they have to pay it back is immaterial. They're getting all this liquidity and they're going to use that to buy up small and medium sized operations that are getting hammered in, in every industry, but not least of all the oil industry and the gas industry. Well, it's happening right now. And what I've been following and I, you, know, you look at where Marathon Refinery sits at the, at the price state. You've got Kentucky, West Virginia, and Ohio. And the big Sandy River. So, <laughs> in Ashland? Because that used to be Ashland, right? Did Ashland, Marathon bought Ashland? Okay. Yes. And so, and, and they do other refinery for other, you know, corporations mm -hmm. too. So, um, so they sit right there at the confluence of the Ohio River and the big Sandy, the world's largest inland port in the United States. Port? Port. Port. Inland okay. ports, okay. meaning that they're shipping right. out there. We have barges go, you know, wild. I come through there quite often on my journey back and forth between states, and you go by where uh, just Cattlesburg is, there was a, a, a uh, that's the refinery area, actually, and then there was a coal-fired power plant, and Twin Towers was there, and all of this coal was along this big sandy river in these Coal trucks would run every day. That's not happening anymore. These these coal fire plants are shutting down. They are some of them are converting to gas. Mm -hmm. um, there, you know, we, we need to turn that direction. But kind of, I want to jump back to that frack gas. If frack gas makes plastic, go into a store and look at how much plastic that we have to deal with. Some of those plastic can, uh, packaging you cannot open with this, you know, <laughs> butcher knife, you know. Um, then you look at our food. 
and how much of the uh, packaging do we need there? And you know, that's when I think that we need to begin to support local economies, our local farmers markets, our local farmers, uh, farm to table, and start turning some of these things around. But just stop buying the stuff. It's simple. We've all been sitting home and, you know, and I want to get on this soapbox because people got these stimulus checks and they're going out there and spending it. And, you know, I, I live in Appalachia and people were talking about going out and buying toys. You know, I have a hard time with that, but, you know, right. just don't buy plastic ones, I guess, you know, is what I would be trying to say. But, um, yeah, so um, the organizing, you know, kind of we took it on a local level and that was my community in Ohio. We stopped them twice. You know, the one in my backyard with the compost, we stop them. You hit it, you hit it hard, and you get the people. If, if it's in, it's, I call this, or it is called NIMBY, not in my backyard. Not in my backyard. And they don't care until it's in their backyard. And the community that I organized with the I like NIMBY, not in anybody's backyard. That's NIMBY. Well, this, this community that I helped save, I mean, I took them by the hand and we did these things that pipeline was going in two miles south of their town and not one of them came to stand with me. Folk, Ohio. Mm -hmm. Well, I've, we've got this, uh, you know, I, I used to call it the Bullet, Ca Bullet County pipeline. Now I'm calling it the Jim Beam pipeline. It's this 11, 12, 14 mile pipeline that they want to put in, in Bullet County. And I'm learning all kinds of stuff like, uh, how do, how do you make a sinkhole? Well, you drill, for one thing, you drill down 300 feet. If you drill down 300 feet, you're going to hit some, you're going to hit a water, a cave, and you're going to hit an underground stream. That underground stream is basically a cave. So you're going to puncture that, and then the water from that, uh, the, that, that groundwater is just going to bubble up to the surface and it's washing out all the mud and the rocks and it's going to cause a sinkhole right there but it's also going to cause sinkholes elsewhere uh, i don't know <laughs> uh, i don't have a point there i'm just trying to learn some stuff about how this stuff works because it it's disgusting i mean there's so many things about the fossil fuel industry that are just disgusting not least of all how they're trying to steal our very future uh, with climate, how they're trying to, you know, assault biodiversity, how they're in bed with big ag, and uh, big ag is removing all kinds of habitat for birds, butterflies, and bees. I, I could go on and on, but I'm interested in, in like, how do you organize, and uh, it seems to me like if you can organize around fossil, you know, preventing fossil fuel projects in, in each locality, then you create an organization of people that know each other and like working together and that kind of thing. Has that been your experience? Yes. Um, yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. Yes, yes. You, have, you know, you have conflicts we, you know, between organizations and, you know, people. I know just starting out as friends, you know, there are people that want to be on board. Yeah, we're going to do this and this will work. Oh, excuse me. And um, then when it gets down to it, it's not about what it's really about, you know, so you have to uh, sort out and find those right people. Mm -hmm. And um, I continue to look, you know, Friends for Environmental Justice, we are a board driven organization, we don't have members, we have communities. So our work is going into a community and seeing what the strengths of those communities are. And finding those key people like our friend Christy and like Vanessa who are willing to stand out against these things, but they cannot stand alone. That bullet pipeline, I've done some work or some looking into that. I've also worked on the old Tennessee, which is a old pipeline very similar that they're bringing through Kentucky. Uh, I think this, this uh, is going to tie in somewhere from some of my research and the other days. Um, there was some, I was contacted again, and, and that's how my work works. People contact me and say, here we are, what do we do? Sometimes I can help. Christy, you know, we, we could go in there and we could plant punk of corn on this pipeline, and there's things we can do to organize. And the things that we do may, you know, right now we have a problem. 
you know, we have a, a, our governor just signed a bill where we cannot interfere with these pipelines. And, and if we would cost them money, it's, it's, it's a risky thing right now to be an organizer in these times and days. The, uh, so we're not, we're not just talking about uh, blocking, physically blocking a pipeline. We're talking about campaigning against it. I mean, what is, what, what is this, like if I'm, if I'm talking about the pipeline, if I'm saying things about Jim Beam and saying things about LG&E, uh, does that make me a terrorist? It's an infrastructure bill. So, yeah, so I'm interfering with, uh, what do they call critical infrastructure? Critical infrastructure. Um, Kentucky's is not so bad. Um, Fitzgerald did some rewrites on that and people were happy with that. In Ohio, um, as an organizer, I could be in Ohio and I could organize an event in a city, Cleveland, Columbus. I kind of sat in the middle of it. And um, if I organize this event, I don't have to be there. My organization is behind it. I'm you know, the head of my organization. Um, I would go down. They would charge me 10 times more fines and I could spend more time in jail because somebody came to that event. And I've seen it happen. Uh, down in the Ashland County area, we... Uh, had a lot of tourism, a lot of, we had the Black River the, in the Muskingum Valley watershed. We had uh, canoeing and campgrounds. I mean, this was the height of it all in Ohio. And so we decided to do a river walk. So we walked down the river road <laughs> and we, um, there was about 30 of us and we carried our signs and we, you know, oil and water do not mix. And uh, we got to the, uh, we, cro we actually got in the water and walked across the Black Fork and went into the Clear Fork River. And you could see the difference in these. And we held a rally right there on the banks of the river. And I did a water ceremony for them to wrap everything up. And we had a heckler come. And the heckler standing across the road and he starts heckling and, you know, uh, my partner stands up and kind of got in between us and I just talked louder and he kind of went away. When it ended up on the newspaper, it ended up, that was the story, was the heckler. And we were fighting, um, but people heard us got a whole page. So they got to hear the story too. And, and you just got to do those things sometimes. But um, the resistance that you find, that person, had there been, had it been on a pipeline or Somewhere else, it could have turned out totally different. I did some organizing with the students at Oberlin College, which is a very progressive college. We uh, were working on the Nexus Pipeline, which is another big, and it was 20 miles from my house. I had these four major pipeline projects going on all around me. So um, we were working on the Nexus. So we had these, um, it was, you, know, you have to have fun too when you're organizing. Right. We took, um, it was the carpet rolls, you know, like, like a pipeline, and we painted them, put Band-Aids on them, and we started, um, the Oberlin uh, community had a, an easement, 50 foot, that went across an old bike trail. And going across this bike trail, they needed an agreement with the city of Oberlin, and they were a charter city. And in order to pass an ordinance, they had to have three meetings, if it wasn't unanimous the first time. Well, Nexus got antsy, third time, they said uh, that they weren't going to put the water line in it they'd originally agreed to. They broke the agreement and that pipeline um, went in, but we resisted. We continue to resist. And uh, there's a couple lawsuits because of that eminent domain thing that they tried to pull. And those are still going on in Ohio. Um, so here's my college students and there's a handful, you know, 10 people, 12 people. So we went over to the easement and come back to the back of a neighborhood. The whole time we were there, there was security that sat there. And when we came through the neighborhood, we, it was a Saturday and we stood on the right of way on the highway in front of the pipeline easement. And the security comes over and he says to the officer, that's kind of, we get escorts. We get asked for escorts a lot of times. And he's trying to say, well, these people got to move. They're on it. And the officer looks at him and says, they're not doing anything wrong. And, you know, then there's times that the kids you know, would go onto a site with coffee and cookies, you know, and, and you know, there, there's different ways of organizing. Um, I find a lot of times we have an opportunity to leave. You know, there's, there's, um, I've done, uh, Blair Mountain was a, an event that we had that was about mining and, you know, uh, guns being taken up against miners. And it was our, our government that was, you know, trying to block the unions back in the uh, mining days. And, you know, I stood in the face of those things and I stood and you make a choice. Am I going to get arrested? Am I not? As an or as a head of an organization, I'm not. My partner 
was first time we went to Washington was 62 years old. And this has been, oh, had to be back around 2007, 2008, maybe before. And he got arrested the first time in Washington carrying the Kentucky flag upside down because of what um, Consul Cole had done to his property. They had falsified leases, they had stolen his land. And um, we're still in, in litigation on that. It's one of those things that until it's over, it's not over. And let, let me ask you, are there any organizations that like journalistic outlets that are pretty aggressive with their language? Um, you know, like they have good hard hitting headlines and things like that, because you know, I'm trying to think about how I can report this stuff without getting sued for defamation. And defamation and libel is when you make a statement of fact, but if you just ask a question, that you, you can't, you know, that's not a defamatory statement. If you give an opinion, that's not a defamatory statement. But I'm just trying to figure out, uh, are there people that are fairly aggressive in their reporting, uh, maybe a little bit sensationalistic even, and does that, or, you know, ha have you seen any of that? Is there a need for that? You know, Justin Noble. Okay. Okay. And, and yeah, uh, we oh, brought he wrote up for Rolling Stone. Did you say? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. He has a book coming out if you can ever get there. And, and he just did a video. Um, and I have that on our um, Facebook page, Friends for Environmental Justice. And um, I, um, met with him, he came into Torch a few weeks ago, and Torch is an area that is an injection well community that we've been some, and that's when we did uh, work organized with Buckeye Environmental Network out of Ohio, and uh, Teresa Mills brought us in. I don't know if you've ever had Tr Teresa Mills on your show, is another good one, Nick. Okay. Yeah. Keep them coming. I'm, <laughs> I mean, this is easy. This is easy. I, I've done thing, I've done interviews that are difficult but for whatever reason, but this is easy because we have a lot in common and because I, I just have to shut up and let you talk. <laughs> I'm not sure how we're doing on time. I've paid no attention. Yeah, yeah we're, we're fine on time. I'll, I'll let you know. We're about, uh, let me see. <clears throat> we've, got, we've got at least uh, another 15 minutes to go. Okay, okay. Um, let me see where would, would be a good place on that one. Um, so, I spent... Um, well, what gives you a passion for this? Jimmy brought this mountain. This mountain that I'm on is called Beaver Mountain. Mm -hmm. I've been stripped, gutted, and fracked. And I, um, when Jimmy brought me down here when we first met some 32 years ago, and his uncle lived here, we went up on the mountain in this little four-wheel drive truck, and they started doing some wildcat and strip mining down there, up there. And we come down the hill and it was like mudslide and it's a wonder we survived it coming down and we said, whoa, this needs fixed. So I told his uncle, if you ever go sell that, let me, um, let me have a f first shot at it. Well, his uncle um, said, you got more money than the gas company. Of course we didn't. And um, when his uncle died, he did put his Jimmy's name in uh, the will so that he had first chance to buy it. Well, as the things go in Appalachia family, is going to um, challenge any decisions made. So we ended up buying it for much less at auction, which was good. And mm -hmm. we knew we were the chosen ones at that point. And right. so for 15 years, we tried to get down here. This past October, we arrived. People kept knocking on our door in Ohio saying, I want to buy your, you know, there comes a time. And so I feel that we were brought down here and, and heavily uh, believe in creators uh, paths that we, you know, we call it the red road that we walk on. And um, we've been here since October and feel pretty safe up here at the head of a holler. Um, Jimmy has 245 acres left. At one time, his family owned, his great-great-great-grandfather owned, I believe it was around 1,200 acres. Um, basically, this is the only piece of land left in that you know, that's that large of a parcel intact on this side of the mountain. And he's got family in there. So there's a lot of family down here for him. Um, I'm in the fixing part of it. I need this healing part. I've had so much of this black snake. I've had so much of the standing rock issues of the, the, the violence of that we see, the bigotism, I guess that's the word, mm -hmm. um, that we see going on in this country. And this is a safe place for me. So the healing part, they, the mountaintop removal sites, um, console was to plant 300 trees per acre 
on a parcel of about 15 acres, I can count seven trees. I want to plant trees. I want to take um, the yellow root and the, the um, elderberries and the um, medicinal parts of the medicines that we have that have always been here. Uh, today I am on Cherokee lands. Um, this, the Cherokee Pikeville was the Shawnee and this side was the Cherokee. It was also the dividing line between in the, the North and the South in the Civil War. So, you know, we have, have our own issues down here. Yeah. <clears throat> but um, this to me, that, that healing part that I'm, I'm looking for, um, you know, plant the trees back. What, you know, I'm putting a hoop garden in in the fall, a high tunnel hoop garden. Um, you know, what chases snakes away my biggest problem down here? Lavender unless they're born in a lavender patch. You know, what are the things that, that we can do? I, um, my grandmother and um, my grandfather was full blood Cherokee and that my other family I have never known. And, you know, there's someday when I have a lot of time, I'm going to finish searching that. But um, this was always known. And when my grandfather died, he shared that information with my aunt who then says, you know, that is full blood Cherokee. So I was able to embrace that and start looking at some of the pieces of that family. And today I am on Cherokee lands again, and, and we don't own the lands. This is, this is my partner's family. You know, this will go on for two more generations in his family. I am a steward of this land. I'm a caretaker of these lands. And um, I tried many years not to do this, not to, to do the fighting, not to do um, what needed to be done. And um, five years ago in January, ninth, I believe it was, there was a chemical spill on the Elk River near Charleston that many people will still remember. It um, damaged the water supply for um, 300,000 people. I had family. My mother's side, I didn't mention that part, my mother's side was from the coal fields of, uh, just uh, north of um, Charleston. Uh, Cabin Creek and Kelly's Creek and you know those, that was my thing. So I would see the bad how mining did, and I could come over to my other grandmas in Kentucky and I could see what it was supposed to look like. So um, during that time of the Elk River spill, I became an, um, an administrator for an organization called Friends of Water. Friends of Water had a lot of people, um, pretty much an online presence in Facebook. And here I'm sitting in Ohio dealing with all this fracking around me. And then we started seeing we've got fracking out in Colorado. So I, you know, uh, at one time worked with the uh, Kentucky Friends of Water Organization, the Ohio Friends of Water Organization, and um, felt that Friends for Environmental Justice was more suitable. It's all about the water, but it's about the justice that we see as well. So um, here on the mountain, I'm here to, um, as we continue to find our way, I want to be able to bring people in. I want to be able to teach these things. I want to be able to, um, um, you know, what's the healing part? What heals the hydro? How do we get rid of these hydro seeds that the Lesperdesia, the uh, Otomala, the, all of these evasive species that the mining companies have sprayed all over these mountains to hide what they've done to the creeks? I want to eradicate those and I want to put back in our indigenous that's, plants. That's called restoration, I'm sure. Mm, something like that, yeah. I mean, they, <laughs> they, I'm, I can see a coal company putting in a bunch of invasive species and calling it restoration. I mean, <laughs> to me, restoration not, means natives, native plants and trees. Exactly, to restore it to the way it was, right. yeah. Um, yeah, we have our fights. The one that we fight the most, and I live right on the creek, and the one that we fight the most is called jewelweed. And it brings beautiful butterflies and it'll grow a foot overnight. And it's just like, oh, oh, you know, so we have our battles and of course, trying to walk the environmental walk, you don't want to use chemicals. You got to fight it with everything you've got. So, mm -hmm. you know, we're working on some of those healing pieces and, you know, bringing people in. So um, some of the work that I've done in the past, I've worked with um, uh, Father John Roush, who just passed away. Um, I would come in from Ohio and I would bring in, he would bring in tours and we were part of that tour. We would show what they did and tell our stories here in the mountains of how they let our people die. And we, uh, there's a, a Martin County, there's another person that you might want to talk to dealing with water quality issues. That's it's all about the water. Remember, if you have heard nothing else I said, it is still about the water. Uh, I believe Boy. that because without water, we can't live. You know, you can, you can even breathe dirty air for a while, but without clean water, you can't live. And one thing that concerns me ab about that is that they can, you know, Coke, Pepsi, and Nestle, they want 
to, they want your water to be polluted because they, then they get to sell you bottled water, you know. There was something very disturbing to me I heard yesterday from my hometown paper in Ohio. Um, there was a spring called the Nehi Spring, and it sits in the middle of, uh, or on the edge of a state park, Malabar Farm. Lewis Broomfield donated the land, and you're surrounded by the Mohican Forest down there, which is a state forest, and they closed the spring. And this spring was uh, a ceremonial spring to me for many reasons, uh, but the story behind it is the natives would walk from the uh, Great Lakes to the Ohio River, and this was one of their stopping points. But for me, it goes deeper. These were places, I mean, the water, they, they closed the spring because they said there was a snake and there was poison hemlock growing around it. Well, they don't, now, the water was always, uh, you know, it's not safe to drink. I've drank this water my whole life. I'd go down and fill my jugs in the middle of winter. And it was a trough. And sometimes in the summer, there would be vegetables there. And, well, they closed this. And, you know, we, I, I was sad because they fracked a half a mile from where this spring is with this Cabot oil coming in and Trans Canada coming in to that community. And um, we don't know what has caused this, but we want this spring open back up. And that's one of the campaigns, you know, I get on these soapboxes and, and um, my friends, I, you know, I've got friends everywhere. So if, if I can help through our friends organization, promote some of the things like the Bullet County. Uh, yeah, the gym. Well, let me ask you, how, I've heard of fracktracker.org. How can we find out where they are fracking in, in Kentucky? Um, on including friend, Bullet County. Um, we can, I have a friend, Ted Ock who is the one who brought his drone to Ashland County and flew over. He's flown all over Rover. Um, he has, I have um, did a presentation at the Appalachian Studies Conference. We did a panel and Ted was one of the speakers with Friends for Environmental Justice. And he came in and um, you know, he, he talks the story. I'll put you in touch with him. They, Please, if, you go to their, if you go to their website, it's a map, you put your map, and you got your information. So it does, he, yeah, we, we can talk more on that. There's um, um, a lot of sharing that we can do. And these are what I call tools in my toolbox. And um, when we need to know, it's just like the pipelines, there's a, a map that shows every pipeline in this country. Um, when I first started working pipelines, I talked with a county engineer and he says, oh, you have no idea how many pipelines are in this county. And I said, I bet I do <laughs> because I had those tools. I had those maps. And you know, the best thing we do is, is educate our people and allow them to speak for themselves in their own community. I don't go into that. I mean, if it's my community, I'm going to speak out. If it's your community, I'm going to show you how. I'm going to help you um, get, you know, your press releases set up and, and, and you know, take care of your business and but, you can yeah. win these battles. Right. That's great. So we're not, we still have a, a few minutes left. So what should we, do you, if you don't mind saying so, what should we be doing in Bullitt County? I feel like, you know, I've come along pretty late. I'm the guy that I'm, I'm willing to record audio and video and maybe write some and they've got some court cases going on. They've got, uh, you know, they pulled these permits out of their ass, you know, if, if they even have a permit. They, they have the uh, Public Service Commission giving permits where they should not have the authority to give permits, you know what I'm saying? So uh, they have a hundred reasons to not grant a permit based on water, alone, based on water, based on wildlife, based on prime farmland. So, well, what yeah. should we do and, and how do you bring a number of people to bear on that? Well, we have to clean house. Clean That's house. the only way we can do. Clean you house. Politics? Yep. You mean get the bad politicians thrown out? Yeah. In including, including incompetent judges and including people with the EEC, Department of Water, Public Service Commission. I'm, st I'm going to start, uh, you know, I'm writing headlines and stuff, and I'm going to start putting Bashir's name on this stuff. You know, is, like, is Bashir going to be complicit? Is Bashir and Jim Beam and lg and &E going to be complicit in ruining people's farmland, ruining our water, 
Uh, it's just a question, you know, are they going to let all this stuff go through without permits? Are they going to have any regard whatsoever for our air, our water, our, our soil? Uh, so am I, am I, am I being, uh, <clears throat> am I going to get myself Night. in trouble talking like that? No, you're not. Because the only way that they're going to hear you is if you speak out. Yeah. Um, I see that, um, they're an organization that lifts people up. Like, uh, I know this evening I couldn't be on that, but, um, Kentuckians for the Commonwealth, I sit mm -hmm. on their land reform committee and tonight they were interviewing a candidate to replace, um, Mitch McConnell. Tomorrow they'll be making calls all over the state, giving you information. You have another candidate. And, you know, I don't agree with all the policies. We're never going to get perfect. I just lost my candidate and they just took him off the ballot today for the presidential election. You know, whoa, you know, but yeah. um, we can make changes and, and get the truth out there. You know, people keep saying, oh, Kentucky people, let this guy be in office for 30 years. He had promises. You were dealing with people whose lives surround, were surrounded by coal. And until their water went poison, they were going to support him. Well, he didn't bring the coal back. And now even his party is saying that um, they want somebody else in there. So we well, got to give them some good yeah, choices. The, to me, the Green New Deal is a whole framework. It's like you can bitch and complain all you want. One problem is that we, you know, some people would say we don't have a real democracy. And I have a lot of sympathy for that. But um, anyway, where was I going with that? It's uh, oh, Green New Deal. You know, it's not enough. Somebody said we don't have a democracy. We have a complainocracy. So we complain about this and complain about that. But what's our alternative proposal? To me, the, the Green New Deal, it, 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 it's a, it, there's different Green New Deals, but pick one and study it. But the you know, Green New Deal is not just about renewable energy, as important as that is. It's about putting people over profits. It's about health care. It's about strong union jobs. It's about control of your uh, destiny, you know, control over your community. You know, democracy is when you get to, uh, you have control over that which affects you. Democracy is when you have a voice in the issues that, that impact you. So that's all I have to say about that. Well, it is the people's voice that is democracy. And we have a failed democracy that has been ruled by um, uh, profit for so long. And, and a friend of mine, I was mentioning Martin County water issue. Well, they're um, one of my friends that helps me here when you know we do different things in the community. And I first time I went to Washington, I heard him, it was Appalachia Rising. And he's up at the Freedom Square. And he's talking about um, how the people of Appalachia have been left behind as collateral. We've got another and minute or two left. Okay, so you know that that we are we have been left behind as collateral damage, and yeah. as long as people sit back and they let these things happen, uh, people from uh, you know I get people from all over the country. Well, you Kentuckians need to do this. No, we need everybody coming in here helping us to get this right. man out of here. It's not always about money, but we can use the money to fight it, right. because he's you know throwing ads that he's claiming things that aren't true, you know, and we need to combat those. And we have social media. I mean. Yeah. And that's that's a small piece of what we can do. Elaine, I could talk to you for a whole other hour if we had the time. So but let's talk again soon. Thanks so much for joining me. Okay, thank you. Keep it up. Okay, Elaine Tanner with uh, Friends for Environmental Justice.